Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving now into what we call a rapid fire session. It makes me feel rapid just thinking about it. I'd like to invite up onto the stage Associate Professor Richard Gallagher, Director of Cancer Services at St Vincent's, and a man who operates on heads and necks. Please make him welcome with a round of applause. Do it again, I want more applause. If you need this bloke, you want him on side. Richard Gallagher. We've had one cancellation on the judges. We've got a lot of travel problems outside this hotel, but it's my pleasure to introduce the second judge, Melissa Devine, Managing Manager of Strategic Communications and Public Affairs, Cancer Institute, New South Wales. I'm now going to run you through the rules. Could I have the bells up on stage? We've got a little bell and a big bell, and we've got young women who are timing things. We have four contestants. They have six minutes each. At five minutes... Did you hear that? And at six minutes... Oh. Six minutes and 15 seconds, I ruck, it's a ruck and maul. I just grab them by the legs and whip them off. OK? Well, I'll try to show a little bit of intellectual sensitivity. We then have up to three minutes Q&A. And I'll give the judges the first opportunity to ask a question. So if you could turn your mic on. Oh, it's probably already on. Otherwise, I can run into the audience. So be quick, guys, because this is rapid fire. Because remember, I'm getting you out of the conference early. The judges will then deliberate over to the side. They've got extraordinary range of criteria, but I'm hoping for a reasonable amount of speed. And while they're judging, I'll whip up my four contestants and we'll have a bit of Q&A. Does everyone feel briefed on the process? Welcome, yes. yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to introduce the first of the rapid fire contestants. Scott, would you head into position while I introduce you? Scott Waldsberger is from Cancer Council of New South Wales. His topic is the evaluation of the effectiveness of smoking cessation e-learning training for the community sector. Please make him welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Um, to start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank Cancer Institute New South Wales for the Evidence to Practice grant that made this project possible. So we've heard a lot today about, um, about changing or how to embed uh, practice in, in smoking cessation delivery throughout clinical practice. And at Cancer Council of New South Wales, we've been working on our program called Tackling Tobacco for the last 10 years in trying to do very similar stuff in community service organizations to address the high smoking rates in, pro in population groups such as those with drug and alcohol dependencies, Aboriginal peoples, people with mental illness, um, or lone parents, um, or homelessness. And so to do that, we take a comprehensive approach to addressing smoking, and it really is about changing the culture of these organizations so that, um, so that staff and the clients feel that this is an important thing to do and it's going to make a difference to their clients um, in their lives and in their health. And so we do this, we talk about having six elements in our Tackling Tobacco program, those being needed committed leadership, comprehensive smoking, um, smoke free policies, supportive systems, training, qu consistent quit support, and data collection and monitoring so that it becomes a quality assurance process in those organizations. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about just one of those components and that's the training component. We've heard over and over that different, um, different groups feel that they don't have the skills to provide smoking cessation. And so it's important that we do provide those skills to our, to our staff or um, so that, they, that smoking cessation, evidence-based smoking cessation, is able to be provided um, and provided in a systematic way. One of the challenges that we have in delivering training is that it's costly in providing a trainer to go out to a service and, and provide that training. And it's also difficult with frontline staff to remove frontline staff from service delivery on a, for an entire day to deliver smoking cessation training. 
So what we did through our Evidence to Practice grant is we developed a e-learning um, package which consisted of four modules and we compared it and offered it randomly to community services that we were working with and Aboriginal Medical Services over between April 2016 and April 2017 and to deliver the training. And so half, half were randomly assigned to face-to-face -face and half were randomly assigned to e-learning. E-learning was taken up by 14 of the services that were offered, and face-to-face -face training was only taken up by eight of the 14 that were offered face-to-face -face training, just because of difficulties in actually finding a full day that they could get a minimum number of staff to attend the training. And this is free training on-site. Um, what we did then is we followed up all training participants with a, a, an immediate um, survey after the training, and then again six weeks later to measure both satisfaction with the training, learning outcomes, and whether they put the learning into practice. We also um, did qualitative um, research, both with focus groups and interviews with, um, with participants in the community service organizations. What we found is that the reach of the e-learning was, was more significant, so we were able to reach both more community service organizations as well as more staff. There was a preference for face-to-face -face training in the, when we surveyed staff, but, um, but that was only slight. And if you look at the left-hand side of the graph here, you can see that when we look at fairly engaging, or very engaging and fairly engaging, that the two different modes of training came out nearly equal but face-to-face um, -face training is seen as more engaging, and that might be leading that preference for it. But when we looked at learning outcomes, we actually found that the learning outcomes were better in the e-learning group than in the face-to-face -face training group. And so, um, so what we see particularly is that e-learning participants were more likely to, remain, to retain the key framework, such as the Fagerstrom test or our smoking care model, and they were also more likely to take action after the course by raising smoking with clients. So 86% of e-learning um, participants did this compared to 53% of face-to-face. -face. Making referrals, so 17% from e-learning versus 7% in face-to-face. -face. And offering nicotine replacement therapy, 34% in e-learning compared to 15% in face-to-face. -face. So regardless of training um, mode, there are room for improvement. And so what we have looked at now is, um, fortunately, I've, um, with a maternity relief, um, I've been able to hire a e-learning content developer who is looking at our training, will be enhancing our e-learning package, but also d designing a blended approach. And I think this reiterates the important need of different types of training and offering that to, um, to staff or a variety of people who are delivering the training too, as Chris mentioned so that we can meet the preferences and the demands and the issues, the limitations or um, obstacles in the, the services to receive the training. So we'll be looking at a combination of e-learning modules, face-to-face um, -face workshops, and webinars or teleconferences to support that training. So, and that's it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you that Scott not only finished before the second bell, he gave time to thank his funders and also uh, acknowledge welcome to country. I mean, another round of applause for Scott. <laughs> Judges, you've got your microphones. Any questions? You don't need to have any. Richard, have you got one? Oh, you need no. to use the microphone. If no, you no, I, I won't nope. go to the audience. Any questions or comments for Scott? Yes, thank you, sir. Coming over to Mr Delaney. Um, Jeff Delaney, Director of Cancer Services, South West Sydney. Um, learning has an opportunity to change behaviour in long term, uh, in short term, but it's harder to sustain. So, what long term outcome measures will you measure to see that the, uh, what is, has been learnt continues to be used over time? Yep. So this is part of an ongoing program and usually where we would offer this training is if a community service organization is willing to work with Cancer Council for a year. We do an audit of the service um, before we start 
then we develop an action plan of what they would like to do around those six elements, and then we work with them and support them in implementing that action plan and then doing an audit again. Um, so that's usually about a, a six to 12 month process, um, and we encourage them to go through that cycle over and over until they get to a point where that change, that organizational change is embedded throughout everything they do and it becomes normal practice. And that may mean needing to do training over and over with staff so that staff could use our e-learning now as a refresher rather than us having to pay to send a trainer out again and again. Anyone else with a question or comment? Oh, good on you, I love it when, because obesity reduction will help me survive. So the further you are away, the better. Run away from me so I can just accelerate. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'll hold it. Hi, Scott. Um, that was fantastic. Just wondering, is this e-learning course freely available online now? So it's not yet. We are currently moving it from the platform that we used with our trainer to Cancer Council's um, website and our, um, our Moodle site. So that is something that we hope to do when we get through a few technical glitches, um, that we can open it up and make it more freely available. One last quickie, because you're the visiting American. Uh, is there any real utility to the face-to-face -face now that you have this, or would you just rather prefer if you were to make a choice, stick with the e-learning? No, I think we need the face-to-face, -face, uh, particularly to get that, um, that feedback, doing some role-playing and stuff, but I think we'll really change what we can do in face-to-face, -face so that what we've, we've tried to cram a lot into face-to-face, -face, a one-day face-to-face in the past, and there hasn't been as much interactivity as far as role-playing and stuff. So I think what we do, try to get the, the basics across in the e-learning, and then use the face-to-face -face time to be much more interactive and in really building the skills and pr pr um, letting people practice that. Um. And promote the e-learning. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Scott. Our second contestant is Emma Sherwood. Emma, if you would like to head to the stage from the University of Newcastle, and her topic is, how do New South Wales hospitals promote smoking cessation care for patients with cancer? Make her overly welcome. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for that welcome. Um, I'm lucky enough to be here to talk to you today about some of my PhD work. Um, and given the theme of the conference, it's quite hard to um, boil this down, but um, the project we're working on is called the Pathways to Smoking Care Implementation Project. And please, if you want to know more about it, especially given the, the discussions this morning, please come and chat to me afterwards. But for the purposes of um, this rapid fire talk with a short time, um, we have two aims for this project. So um, the first one is there, we wanted to identify the degree to which um, hospitals in New South Wales were providing smoking cessation care to cancer outpatients. Um, and we also wanted to describe staff attitudes towards smoking cessation care. So if they thought it was important for their patients and if they thought it was appropriate as well. Um, and again, the background to this project, Graham so well covered this morning, I'll just boil it down to smoking in cancer is bad, cessation is good. Now that's a message. Um, all right, so to do this, we administered a cross-sectional survey to um, all staff working in cancer care, um, including oncologists, nurses, and allied health, um, across seven different oncology treatment centres, which were located within seven public hospitals in New South Wales. Um, we invited quite a few and had a 31% response rate, which is not great for a survey response rate, but perhaps not unusual to those of us who are familiar with doing surveys among clinical staff, unfortunately. Um, and so the email was uh, the survey was sent via an email link. Um, so a key member of staff at each oncology centre sent the email out to all their staff. So hopefully um, the staff were more receptive to a, being approached that way. Um, the survey contained items to um, relating to those two aims I talked about. So we had 20 items there about the support strategies to facilitate smoking cessation care, and then 11 items about the appropriateness and significance of smoking cessation care. And the results for the AIM-1 here you can see. Um, we had a list of 20 policies or strategies. We asked, has your hospital used this or implemented this in the last two years? And the three most commonly reported are listed in order there on the table. So a specific section on patient files to identify their smoking status, um, a policy about smoking cessation for patients who smoke, and information that prompts patients to ask staff to provide smoking cessation care. Uh, for the keener eyes of you out there, you might have noticed that 
although these were the three most commonly reported items, um, there were a greater proportion that reported unsure. They didn't know if it was available at their hospital. So that indicates there might be a bit of ambiguity about these pathways. They might have services that do exist there, but they might not know about it. Um, but a slight disclaimer here is that we haven't looked um, at whether these answers are different across each hospital. So we don't, we're not quite sure, but we're going to find out um, if all the staff at one hospital are reporting yes or whether a few are reporting different yes, no, or unsure. Um, so then if we go on to, hopefully, yep, um, the results for the second aim. So here we assess this, um, the attitudes via just um, an agreement statement. So we ask them to either agree or disagree to a, um, 11 different items. Um, and I'm just presenting the uh, proportion who are selected either strongly agree or agree. Um, so in terms of the recognising the clinical importance of smoking cessation care, there's pretty affirmative response there. 86% recognised that, yep, smoking cessation care is important. Um, interestingly, we had 60% of staff say that, yes, they can find time to help patients who want to quit smoking, which is fantastic finding, especially given what Graham was talking about this morning, with that 1% who can find time and want to help them. Um, again, a slight disclaimer here, we haven't looked at um, different staff roles within that 60%, so whether they're all going to be allied health or they're all nurses or they're all oncologists, but another point of interest that we're quite um, interested in finding out later down the track. Um, and again, this is probably echoing what we've talked about already, but not many um, staff indicated they know how to motivate their patients to quit smoking. So 20%, so um, there's room for improvement there. So some conclusions. We found that some, but perhaps not all centres, have the capacity to provide smoking cessation care. Um, and again, there might be some, some ambiguity within the hospital itself, so it's not, necessary, not necessarily the fact that the systems don't exist. Like we talked about Quitline today, it exists, but perhaps staff just aren't aware of it. Um, and perhaps these pathways and referral mechanisms just aren't being widely um, advertised or disseminated within the hospital. Um, and the staff agree that smoking cessation care is important for their patients, but perhaps they're not providing it because they lack those oncology-specific skills. So it's not to say that they're not sure how to um, help patients in general or the general population um, quit smoking, but perhaps it's the factor of the oncology-specific um, skills that um, prevent them from delivering care. Um, so some final thoughts, which is what Chris has covered, and it's not um, nothing unusual that you haven't heard today, but perhaps because we know smoking cessation is such a powerful clinical risk indicator, we need to find ways to help train and support staff to provide it. Simple statement, doing it is another issue. Um, so hopefully we'll find some um, answers to that question at the next conference. Thank you. Emma has finished even earlier talking about a PhD in less than six minutes. Another round of applause. Um, questions or comments, please wave at me. Uh, for Emma. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased you're so far away. And don't jump up and run towards me to help me. Just stay seated. Um, just a simple question. Just wondering, the participants, were any of, did you identify if any of the participants were smokers themselves? Or, uh, yeah, or were we, the staff non-smokers? We did ask that question and the majority were non-smokers. I can't remember the exact figures, but um, yeah, we certainly included that and the majority were not smokers. Other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, go for it, Richard. Oh, it does work. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, Close to your mouth. <laughs> it's like an ice cream. Um, okay, Emma. Yeah, excellent. Uh, but look, can you just explain to me, because I'm a bit shocked uh, that uh, I, I suppose my, my question is, who are, the who are the clinicians or the oncologists, right, and do they, uh, do they include surgeons? Um, so that's one question. Yep. Uh, it's close to my heart. And the other one is uh, I'm, I am shocked by the I know how to motivate patients to quit smoking and only 20% of people can actually say that they can't. You know, I, have you explored that? I, d I don't understand that. Did I? Have you explored it? Uh, what does what, that mean? About how they know, know how to motivate them. Can't they just say you need to stop smoking, smoking is bad? But, yeah, that's very that, simple. That motivates a lot of oncology patients. Yeah. Like <laughs> cancer, you know. Yeah, uh, sure, uh, that, that would be great. But perhaps um, I think in terms of the motivation here, I think it's more about the uh, oncology-specific things. And I think it, it's also reflective of perhaps um, these clinicians are thinking that um, in amongst the whole um, cancer 
context, smoking is perhaps not a priority. So they don't know how to activate that motivation. So perhaps they're, um, you know, some, some people might be more focused on like the physical activity aspect of cancer or, you know, talking about um, clinical treatments might be more, um, is that, okay, you look that like I'm not answering that question. No, 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 you answered it, you answered yes. it. I'm just, I remain shocked. Uh, can Thanks. I, yeah. could I, may I come to Dr. Warren because Richard Gallagher didn't have the, op he's a head of cancer services at St. Vincent's. He didn't have the opportunity to hear your presentation, although I know you've spoken to him. But what do we kn know from your research about the degree to which uh, medical clinicians working in cancer feel they have the skills to motivate and help people stop? Uh, well, actually, uh, to what Richard described, the motivation with regard to smoking is bad and the need to quit largely is intact. The techniques necessary to try and motivate patients to quit through motivational techniques such as motivational interviewing, behavioral counseling, things like that, is not intact. And technically, in the realm of smoking cessation, that is a huge tool that's advocated for. So the training necessary to motivate using behavioral skills, uh, psychotherapy, things like that, that is not intact. Whereas the baseline, hey, it's, it's bad, you need to quit, period, that's my motivation, uh, that, that's there in, in, in a large degree. So, so in other words, we have to stop, but in other words, there's a room for clinician, medical clinicians in, working in cancer to learn more about how to motivate. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're about to cut people's head open. They're, they're likely to feel very motivated at that moment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Emma for that marvellous presentation. <laughs> uh, and our next contestant uh, in our rapid fire session is Rachel Kins and Mina Hua. If they could both head to the stage. Uh, just you, thank you. Just Rachel, thank you. And the topic is shaping interventions to address water pipe smoking in an Arabic speaking community, a qualitative study. Please make her welcome. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah. We're not going to count this time, okay? We restart it. Are the gentlemen up the back working oh, on this? On, there we go. Thank you. I think that's it. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so today I'm talking about a qualitative research project that investigated the perceptions held by an Arabic-speaking community about water pipe smoking and health promotion. So just a bit of background to water pipe smoking. It's a traditional method of tobacco use that's becoming increasingly popular worldwide, especially among young people and women. It's most prevalent in Asia, Africa and the Middle East, but its use is rapidly emerging on other continents and it's accounting for an increasing share of global tobacco use. Although it's often perceived as less harmful as other methods of tobacco, group, tobacco use, there's accumulating evidence to indicate that there are harmful effects associated with water pipe smoking. These include toxicity, lung cancer, and periodontal disease. However, there's little known as well about the range and effectiveness of health promotion interventions to address this type of tobacco use. Evidence about the prevalence of water pipe smoking in Australia is also limited. The 2013 National Drug Strategy Household Survey found that among Australian adults, 2% had used water pipe previously in the last year. A further 4% had previously used it, but not in the past 12 months. Two small research studies conducted with Arabic-speaking communities in Australia suggest that rates are much higher in this um, population group, with these studies showing that approximately 12% were current users. Community consultations conducted as part of a tobacco intervention project with an Arabic-speaking community in metropolitan Sydney found that water pipe smoking was a prevalent and accepted practice, and there was a lack of belief in potential associated harms. In response to these findings, we conducted a qualitative research study, including focus groups with an Arabic-speaking community from South Eastern Sydney Local Health District. The project partners um, included South Eastern Sydney LHD, the Centre for Primary Health Care and Equity at UNSW Sydney and the community. Oh, sorry. This one? Okay. So this research aimed to explore the perceptions held by Arabic speaking communities about the extent of water pipe use, the cultural factors underpinning its use, community concerns and knowledges of harm, and health promotion interventions that would be acceptable to community for addressing water pipe smoking. 
we had 88 people participate in 10 focus groups that were conducted by bilingual community research assistants. Participants ranged in age from 18 to 60 plus years. However, the majority of participants, approximately 82%, were aged between 18 and 35, so it was quite a young group of participants. They reported that water pipe smoking was widely practiced in the community across age groups and genders and that use was increasing. Factors which appeared to promote use includes, included the increased accessibility of water pipe, mostly at home and at restaurants and cafes, and that water pipe had become increasingly trendy and fashionable, particularly among young people. Our findings suggested that there are a couple of, or a few key interrelated factors that were underpinning water pipe use in this community. Firstly, it was strongly connected to cultural identity and the family appeared to have a significant role in passing on the practice of water pipe smoking, enhancing this cultural and social acceptability. Most focus groups described a lack of concern or awareness about, the no about harms in the community about health effects associated with water pipe smoking. The practice also seemed to have a different meaning to people than cigarettes. It was frequently described as less harmful and more acceptable than cigarette smoking. And it was strongly connected with socialising and relaxation, as I mentioned. It was also described as a safer alternative for teenagers and young people than other forms of entertainment and drug use, which further suggests that there are misconceptions about the harms associated with its use. The omission of water pipe smoking from legislation, policy and health promotion campaigns addressing cigarette smoking was also raised as a factor that reinforced perceptions that it wasn't harmful and it wasn't dangerous. We also found that the perceptions about the need for health promotion interventions to address water pipe smoking and the type of interventions that would be acceptable um, varied both between the groups and within the groups. So there was a lot, of, yeah, a lot of variation in what people thought would be useful. Let's see if I can. Okay. Oh, is it gone? I think it's the next one. Uh, can we help can at we the back? Just, Have yeah, you got please. Uh, just the third uh, just slide. the final <laughs> slide, please. Thank you. The lack of awareness about the health effects of water pipe smoking and the variation found in the perceived need for health promotion suggests that community readiness should be considered in the development and implementation of health promotion interventions to address water pipe smoking. Interventions that increase community awareness about health effects and debunk the myths that exist about water pipe being a safer alternative to cigarettes may work to enhance this community readiness to participate in health promotion interventions. The link between water pipe smoking and cultural identity and suggests that there is also a need for a culturally sensitive approach toward the development of health promotion interventions and messages and one that partners with Arabic speaking communities. Uh, incorporating water pipe smoking in legislation, policy and health promotion campaigns that address cigarette smoking is another direction that could be considered, so we're making more of a link between cigarette smoking and water pipe as well. So just in conclusion, um, the trend of water pipe smoking is increasingly increasing internationally and it's reinforced in Arabic speaking communities by social and cultural factors, as well as a reduced awareness of health effects and perceived harm. This study suggests that increasing awareness of the health issues associated with water pipe, as well as the readiness of the community to participate in health promotion interventions, are important first steps towards addressing water pipe use. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that this initiative and research was funded by the Cancer Institute New South Wales and South Eastern Sydney Local Health District Multicultural Health and Health Promotion Services. And just, I'd also like to acknowledge the rest of the research team from the Centre for Primary Healthcare and Equity, South Eastern Sydney LHD, and also our study participants who, yeah. Information. Thank you Thank so you. much. A, a round of applause, please, for Rachel. Any questions or comments from, from that fascinating... Uh, thank you. Do you want to head towards me too, just as an idea? It's just a thought. And here we go. Good on you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, is there much data on like, how often someone would use a water pipe as opposed to going out every three hours for a cigarette? Um, what we found was that it really was associated more with um, that social aspect. So people would get together and, and smoke water pipe rather than something that they were doing multiple times a day. I think there are probably a small percentage of people who were doing that, but really it was more hours that people spent together socialising and smoking water pipe. Hi, my question isn't directly related to your presentation, but it's more a comment. Is there anything we can do um, 
earlier in the piece when clinicians are being trained and are at university to somehow focus and, and I suppose really, you know, demonstrate the message um, around smoking cessation because if that starts early in the piece when they're being trained and it's reiterated over and over again, maybe that's a good opportunity as well that we haven't really explored widely today. So mm. just a comment. Thank you, and that's a very valuable comment, and, and that within that training, the cultural diversity of Australia being represented. Uh, you know, even as you speak about it, the thought of sitting in a cafe giggling and watching the water bubble. I'm not even Arabic and I can see the attraction. You know, it's a very powerful thing. Any other question or comment? Oh, good too, so it would be quite quick, please. Thank you. Um, given that um, water pipe smoking is so culturally linked um, mm. and clearly they, the people that do that get a lot of enjoyment sitting socially with each other to do that, how do we break that kind of idea down? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to say that's an enjoyable activity and I too am somewhat attracted to it. Um, how do we sort of break that down and replace it with another activity or something like that? Yeah, I think that's the million dollar question, <laughs> actually. Um, yeah, it definitely, a lot of the participants just said, don't touch it because it's, uh, it's our part of our cultural identity. So I think it is, maybe it is reconnecting with other parts of culture and, and putting more of a focus on that. But I think part of it is really, I think, raising the awareness about the harms associated because people just don't know. So um, perhaps if we start at that point, yeah, we can look at other ways of yeah, connecting with culture that are just as important. One last here. Thanks for your presentation. I was just wondering whether you looked at tobacco and non-tobacco water pipe use? Um, no, not particularly. Okay. We didn't really break down the different, yeah, type. I think it was, yeah, sorry. Rachel, thank you very much. Would you give her a warm round of applause? <laughs> and our final contestant is Associate Professor Christine Paul. I've personally missed her. Have you noticed she's been off the stage for quite some time? So if we could urge you to take your position and you'll remember that Christine is from the University of Newcastle and she's going to talk about continued smoking after a cancer diagnosis, a longitudinal study of intentions and attempts to quit. Please make her welcome. And can you click up the back, guys, please? Thank you. Oops. We've gone past. Can we go back one? Back, 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 back. I'm tempted to keep talking for longer than my six minutes so we can end the session with Julie Crash tackling me. Because <laughs> that might bring I me... I come to your home and do it later. No, no. For, <laughs> for more media attention to our cause. It could, you know be popular. Anyway, so going forwards, so i just like to acknowledge my co-authors there and um, I'll jump right in for time. The aims of this particular study were to describe the patterns and behaviours of Australian smokers who have cancer and follow them for up to three and a half years after diagnosis to look at the stability of smoking status after diagnosis and also to look at patterns of quit attempts and the role of quit intentions, particularly from the, the view of that idea that if someone doesn't quit at diagnosis, then they never will. So what we did, this was part of the much larger cancer survival study, which involved um, recruiting adults who were diagnosed with their first primary cancer in the prior six months via two state cancer registries. It um, identified over 3,000 people who were eligible for this study. They were mailed a hard copy scannable survey, which was looking predominantly at psychosocial wellbeing issues over those three and a half years, but also looked at health behaviours. They had mail and telephone reminders to um, increase response rates, and they were followed up at four time points. So the first, the baseline survey was at six months post-diagnosis, where we got around 40% of the, that original 3,000 at um, one year post-diagnosis, then two years post-diagnosis, and then three and a half years post-diagnosis. And by the, that three and a half year point, there was just under a third of people who completed those surveys. So in terms of our results, this just gives you a bit of an idea over those four time points of the number of um, never smokers, so that's the non-smoker column, then the former smokers, so you can see there's kind of 47, 48% of people who were former smokers in the sample across time. In terms of current smokers, we had 8.6% who said they were at baseline, 
again, 8% at the 12-month follow-up. Then at the two-year follow-up, there was just under 7% who said they were smokers, and then uh, just over 6% at the three-and-a-half-year point. What I've included on the right-hand end is the numbers of missing data. So you can see quite a few people didn't answer that question. So our guess is that quite a proportion of those people are smokers. So looking a bit more closely at those people who said they were former smokers, we found that 11% of them said that they had quit after being diagnosed with cancer. So we're talking about a six-month period here, so that 11% is quite a bit higher than you would find in the general population of smokers. So it supports the view that the diagnosis in itself does prompt quitting, as you might expect. About 4% said they'd quit in the 12 months before their cancer diagnosis, so that's a bit closer to what happens with the general population of smokers. And then 85%, the majority of them, said they had quit more than a year before their diagnosis. So now looking at um, quit attempts among the, those who were smokers at each time point, you can see at um, six months after their diagnosis, 71% are saying that they've tried to make a quit attempt since diagnosis. At time two, again, there's a high proportion of those people who are still smokers who say that they've made a quit attempt since they were last surveyed. And you can see right there to three and a half years post-diagnosis, there's 44% of people who are smokers who are still trying to quit. So that idea that the diagnosis is your last chance to quit and the last time that smokers will try to quit is not true. So then looking at whether their intention to quit at that six months post-diagnosis time was going to predict what happened later. We found that at times two, three, and four, there were um, small to moderate proportions of those who had been intending to quit who succeeded. So at 12 months post-diagnosis, 8% of those who had said, I'm going to try and quit, managed to. And this column, as you go down, is cumulative. So 17% had managed to quit by the... Um, the two-year time point, and almost 21% had managed to quit at the three-and-a-half-year time point. So I think what that tells us is that it's a myth that if you don't quit at diagnosis, then you never will. And certainly um, cancer survivors are still trying to quit years after their diagnosis. They still see it's important, they still want to, and they're struggling. So what they're likely to most benefit from is ongoing support to quit throughout survivorship. Thank you. Honestly, for someone who wanted me to tackle her, she finished under time. I Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to ask our judges if I could, unless you have a question for, for Christine, do you, you can stay there and confer or you can go over there. And as soon as they have decided who the winners are, they will re-enter their chairs and I will stop. Do you know what I'm saying? And move into what we call the final stage of the conference. In the interim, I thought we could ask the uh, people, Scott, Emma, Rachel, and Christine's already up there, just to come up on stage. I'm very impressed you've got the knees to go straight off the side. I need the steps at this stage. And can you grab microphones, guys? They're all live. Maybe stand, because it gives energy at this time of the afternoon. And it's an opportunity for any questions or comments to our peeps while they make the judging. Questions or comments? Who would like to be the person? Look at them. Yes, thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself? And then... Oh, hello, I'm Darrell. Um, I'm from the Australian New Zealand Melanoma Trials Group. Um, I just had a question for Emma, um, just whether you ha saw any differences bet in your responses between the um, doctors and the other allied health people. Yeah, push it up. As, yep, as close enough. That is gorgeous, Emma. Excellent. Um, that's a very interesting question and something we're definitely going to explore, but we're just not quite at that stage yet, sorry. So... Keep me posted. <laughs> Can I ask a question, just as an outsider? Given everyone's so obsessed with evidence-based clinical care, why are people working in hospitals so, uh, like about 70%, don't reply? To the survey? Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, there must be research on that. What is and it? And if anybody has an answer, please feel free to jump in, because I'd love to know as well. I mean, seriously, that's a, from a patient point of view, I want you filling in the forms. Does anybody know why it's... Yes, thank you, May. I just come down to you. Yeah. We get so many. 
is the basis. You get them from your own disciplines, you get them from cancer disciplines, you get them from lots of different varieties of um, people asking questions. Is there a solution to increase the answering of individual ones by better targeting to where they go or you know, how can we improve it? I don't think the ones I get aren't targeting me in the right way. I might be the relevant person to answer them but sometimes you open it up and it's got 120 questions and you just go, oh my God, I don't have time to do this now and you don't get back to it. Okay, thank you. There was Julie, another... Th th Julie, yeah. there is evidence that um, offering exorbitant prizes helps. I was about... <laughs> Can I give you a quick anecdote? Oh, are you back? Are you ready to go? There's two more questions. Can I just quickly take them? And I, if there's room for my anecdote, I'll give it to you later, but I'll give the audience pat. I'm going to meet you halfway. I have two very important questions. One, you are the most outstanding interviewer, chaser arounder, motivator, <laughs> thorough person I've ever seen. Outstanding job. Will you do this again? Because it was really amazing. The second, and I need your help with this, I'm going to ask them the question, and then you're going to have to ask the right people a question. In the evolution that has been today, let's say we implement cessation and we get support for that. There's financial support, infrastructural support, clinical support to actually make this happen. As far as I can tell, it is exceptionally important to also couple that with funds and resources to be able to research the change that will come, research the behavior patterns, the uptake, participation, cessation efficacy, clinical outcomes, and how that could impact not only the cost of cancer care, but even the development of new research and so forth. So I see a dual role between providing support for cessation service as well as research. I'd like to know what you think, and then I'm going to rely on you to find the right people to ask the same questions. Could I ask Christine and then Richard to answer that question, if that's okay? So can you come first? Yeah. Well, I think um, if we could educate people on grant review panels that this is really important, then that would, would increase it. And I think there's um, mechanisms like partnership project funding where um, LHDs, Cancer Institute, other organisations can partner with researchers to do research that's very targeted at what they need to know in order to implement things. Uh, the question is, is really goes to the question of sources of funding for both the research into the effectiveness of programs in behavioural change, but also in the support to clinicians yeah. of all kinds to do it. So your, your thoughts? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think that the, uh, I think it's actually all about uh, leadership, yep, and uh, I think it's going back to our LHDs uh, and uh, discussing uh, with the senior executive about uh, the necessity to introduce a program or to start to engage, I think you know it's going to be a it's going to be a combination of things. It's going to be something on the ground, and it's going to be in combination with phone uh, support. Uh, I think, but it's there's funding, and we can make the funding. The hospitals can find the funding. Um, there, I mean, I hate I know we live in you know difficult environment, but we can do it, and it won't require a huge amount of money to gain a lot for the health system and for each hospital. It's almost a leadership issue, this, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I think it? it's a leadership issue. I think it's issue. a leadership issue. Um, look, ladies and gentlemen, because our uh, judges are ready to go, do you want to sit down? You're like people in a beauty contest and you don't know who's going to get to squeal. Could, <laughs> could, could I please invite Shelley Rushton, the Director of Cancer Services Information at the Cancer Institute, to come on stage? Uh, Shelley, if you could just come up. Have we got a photographer, a proper photographer? Yes, come, do you want to come down? Are you going to do it from a distance? Okay, there's going to be an unbelievably natural photo of Shelley shaking someone's hand. And I would like to ask Richard Gallagher to pick up the microphone and on behalf of himself and Melissa Devine, first of all, a clap to both of them for doing the judging. Uh, and a, a clap to all our speakers because seriously, they were great. But in life... There are winners, and we're about to find out one. Okay, the winner? Very close to your mouth, sir. The winner is Emma. We and thought you were engaging and on time and on topic. Engaging at all times, on topic and on time. Congratulations. And if, if our contestants could leave the stage, and can you clap them off for that marvellous thing?